The Radical. Fundamental principles of freedom, rational self-interest, and individual rights. This is The Yaron Brook Show. All right, everybody. Welcome to Yaron Brook Show on this, um, what is it? It's Wednesday. Uh, Wednesday night, uh, and uh, happy you guys could all make it. We've got a, uh, I think, an interesting show today. Uh, we're going to be talking about what drives history, what moves the world, uh, inspired by, I guess, me watching a bunch of Harari videos and reading Peter Zihan's book. So I think that'll be cool. And then after that, we'll talk about um, uh, westerns, movies, westerns. And in particular, uh, we'll, I'll do a review of uh, True Grit uh, in the context of talking about Westerns, which was uh, Shaw's Bot. I know it's out of order. He asked me to review stuff before this, but I, I convinced my wife to watch it, so it was easy. So, um, uh, yeah, so we'll get to, uh, we'll get to talk about uh, True Grit. Uh, hopefully, Shaw's Bot will be here. If he's not here yet, uh, hopefully he'll arrive in time. Uh, to hear the review, uh, let's see. I had seen the movie before, so it wasn't my first time. Uh, <clears throat> what did I want to? Uh, I want to do something here. That's it. There we go. All right. So uh, we're going to talk about that. Uh, of course, as always, uh, you will help uh, determine the uh, the content of the show today by uh, using the super chat to ask questions uh, and uh, steer the show in the direction that you would like it to head based on the questions uh, that you like. You can ask questions about the topics we are discussing um, and uh, or uh, anything else, anything else. Uh, on the Iran Brook Show, we have Ask Me Anything every single show because I know everything and you guys can ask me. <laughs> anyway, um, so uh, that is kind of the outline of the show. Uh, I, I think we're going to start two pieces of good news, two. I mean, the world is, something's happening because we've got two pieces of good news today rather than, you know, me squeezing together one piece of good news sometimes. And um, anyway, uh, it, chat is always distracting. Uh, so two pieces of good news. First is the Kemi uh, Badenoch, Kemi Badenoch, um, who is a member of parliament in the UK, a member of the Conservative Party, somebody who I did, I, I was on the same side debating uh, against the socialist, and she was on my side, and we kind of really, uh, I thought we did a good job together, and we talked a little bit afterwards, so I've got a bit of a relationship with her. Anyway, she... Has, has been assigned the post in the uh, new British um, cabinet. She is responsible for trade, for international trade. And I think that's fantastic. I mean, she is a free marketer. Um, she expressed strong commitment to capitalism. You know, you're always expecting to be disappointed by politicians. So I hope, I really, really, really do hope, you know, pray to the gods of politicians or the gods of whatever... Um, that uh, she sticks to that position and that she, you know, opens up the UK to international trade, that she makes, uh, that she goes out there and, and makes great deals or not. I mean, she's not going to lower tariffs unilaterally to zero, which would be my trade strategy, um, even though she probably knows that's the right thing to do. Uh, because it's politically suicide, right? But hopefully she goes out there and increases the scope of free trade uh, for the UK. If, if the UK does that, if the UK actually liberalizes, opens up um, uh, on the free trade front, then, wow, I mean, I think, I think the UK has quite a future for a variety of reasons. A um, uh, variety of reasons. Valdron, why do you need to know how many shows I'm going to do in the next four days? Four days, five, yeah, I, why? I'm curious why. You, you trying to allocate your money and make sure you don't spend it all today since you have a little bit of money for the next few? 
Um, so today we're going to have a show. We'll have a show on, I think we're going to have a show on Friday. I'm trying to figure out the time of day. It might be an unusual time of day because I've, I, in the evening on Friday, 8.30, which is usually the time I do the show, I am doing a talk in, um, in, in Tokyo, but by Zoom. So this will be a talk in Tokyo to encourage people to come to my live talk in Tokyo a week later. So we'll do that at 8.30 on Friday night. So we'll do a, a Yvonne Book Show earlier in the day. Uh, then there'll be a show on Saturday. There'll be a show on Sunday. And then I'm trying to do a show on Monday. And I leave Tuesday early morning. So we'll see. The Monday show is very iffy because it'll be just before I leave. And there'll probably be stuff I need to do. And, uh, you know, anyway, we'll see. I, I don't know. Um, so Kemi... Kerry Bernock has a, a, a position, an important position, uh, a, a, a position with uh, which can have a real impact. Um, uh, it's it's great news, and and I hope she is incredibly successful. I did um, send her a direct message on Twitter um, because she does follow me on Twitter. I follow her, and she follows me on Twitter. Uh, just congratulating her, and she wrote back and said, "Thank you, Yvonne." So cool. Hopefully she remembers who I am, and maybe next time in the UK, maybe in October, I, I, I can see if she wants to hang out. I don't know. We'll see. That'd be cool. Maybe she'll do an event with me. I don't know. We'll we'll see. Uh, but that that could be that 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 would be nice. Nice that she responded. Uh, Ryan, uh, thank you for the support. Really, really appreciate it. And that's uh, C A, which means that's uh, California dollars. No, that's Canadian dollars. All right. Um. That's the first piece of good news, I, I, way over on the other side of the ocean. The second piece of good news is closer to home, much closer to home. And that is, uh, it's in Arizona. Uh, and Arizona is a difficult state right now, but um, Arizona has one of the best, I think, one of the best state-run think tanks in the country called the, uh, the Goldwater Institute. And the Goldwater Institute years ago started promoting an idea of education saving accounts um, education saving accounts is where the state puts, will put in your bank account, in a special account, um, the equivalent of what they spend on a child's public education in your account for you to spend on private education, homeschooling, uh, any kind of education you want, but, but, but really pretty broad, right? Um, this has been my preferred method of school choice. I think this is a fantastic way uh, to promote school choice and, and to introduce school choice. Arizona adopted this originally only for children with uh, some form of learning disability. So it was, it was were not used uh, much. But um, t uh, not today. I only read about it today, but it turns out that two weeks ago, two, two and a half weeks ago, um, Arizona expanded this to every child in the state. So 1.2 million kids in Arizona now have the ability to choose their school and to actually have the state fund at least a portion of private education and fund um, homeschooling. I think the average uh, that the state spends on a child in public education is something like $6,500. So parents will get a check for $6,500, not a check. It will be going to the special bank account. And they will be able to use that $6,500. Um, they'll be able to use it for anybody, for any kind of education, educating their, their child. This is, an, uh, this is amazing. It is the way in which we can privatize education. I think it's the best way on the most important topic we have. Um, it's a way in which you solve the problem of what about the poor? Because the poor get the check for $6,500 as well. You, you get competition among private schools to try to attract that money, to try to get parents to spend the money on them. Hopefully, tons of private schools will enter the state of Arizona and start competing for the money. Uh, and as a consequence of that, uh, parents will start realizing that they could provide their kids with a much better education, and that will uh, that will encourage them to pull them out of government schools and put them into um, 
the private schools that are competing to get their attention. I think this is fantastic. It's it's it, 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 it's not a voucher system where the where the, the government has to choose what education it promotes and which it doesn't. This is much better than that. Uh, this is the best way to do this. So I'm I'm super excited uh, about it and um, hope that it takes off. Now the only problem, and this is why private schools are hesitating to enter the state of Arizona and really compete, is that the uh, teachers' unions and the left are uh, threatening to take this to a, um, what do you call it, a referendum. Uh, in the past, Arizona residents have voted against such a scheme in a referendum. But you see, why invest in Arizona if I'm a private school owner? Why would I invest in Arizona if this could be yanked in a year or two? This is why I hate referendums. The referendums are direct democracy. I'm a big opponent of direct direct. I am a big opponent of direct democracy. <laughs> there we go. I can speak now, uh, and and this is why right? they can pass anything anytime. Uh, so um, this would be uh, this would be a. Um, Anyway, this would be phenomenal if it sticks, if it sticks. So uh, very excited. Congratulations to Goldwater Institute that managed to get this passed uh, through the legislature and the governor signed it. And um, yep, that'll be, that'll be good. Um, let's see. Uh, all right. Uh, all right. Let's jump into the topic. All right, so um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, what drives history and why almost everybody, I think, gets it ultimately wrong, or um, most people get it wrong, at least most commentators get it wrong when you read about it. Uh, you know, the, uh, the germs, guns, whatever uh, kind of books um, and, and other books of that genre, and I'm reading right now the end of the world is just beginning, the beginning, and of course Harari has his version. Um, and and you read them, and, and first of all, they're fascinating books, Guns, Gems, and Steel, fascinating books, really interesting. I mean, I love history, and they have these amazing stories and amazing theories, and a lot of the theories, there's a lot of truth to them, and the they, 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 stuff comes together, and you just you just learn a lot, by reading these kind of books, you learn a lot about the concretes that are going on um, in the world and have happened in the world, and it, it enriches it enriches one not one's knowledge. And and this came to mind because I'm I'm reading the end of the world is just the beginning. And granted, I've only read the first few chapters that deal primarily with the past. And and let me first say before I criticize the book. Um, you know my 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 my, critic, my criticism of the approach and my criticism of the book. Let me first say that I'm really enjoying the book, and I really like it. Uh, it's wrong in some fundamental sense, and we'll get to that. But um, it's fascinating. It's really really interesting, and a lot of what he says is true, and a lot of what he says is right, and a lot of what he says I hadn't thought of. And it's new to me, and that's exciting, and that's fun when you read a book like that. And it's big in scope. It's, it covers so much. It covers so much of human history. And what he's doing in this book is he's setting it up for an analysis of the future, a, a, a predictive model, which is great because in 10 years we'll be able to tell him you were right or you were wrong, although he might be right for the wrong reasons. That's also possible. Um, but... And I agree with, to a large extent, with his predictions. At least I think I do. And I agree with much of his analysis. And the thing that is, I find most interesting is, and, and I give him a lot of credit for this, he is absolutely right on how great the world is and has been since World War II. And in many respects, since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. He gets that. And he gets it in a way that most people don't get. He gets it in a way that the left doesn't get, the left has no clue about, 
the left is completely clueless about. And he gets it in a way that, because they're so anti-capitalist, anti-markets, and, and don't have any kind of conception of the state of the world, how poor people were, how horrible life was, and what the Industrial Revolution actually achieved and did. But he also gets it better than the right, particularly the right, uh, the, the kind of conservative right, because he says, uh, as of 2019, now, he believes 2019 is the peak. Life is amazing. And to a large extent, he attributes why our material life is so good and has been so good over the last, uh, since World War II at least. He attributes it to free trade. He attributes it to globalization. So he is one of the few writers today that I see who are all in on globalization. All in, not that he thinks it's going to survive. He thinks it's going to collapse completely and going to go away uh, and, and going to drive the world economy in, into a real rut. Um, but he believes it's a good thing. He believes it's the source of much of our prosperity, much of our success, much of our wealth and, and quality of life and standard of living, ours and the rest of the world. So he's a huge proponent of... Um, globalization, and I give him a huge amount of credit for that because it's not easy to be pro-globalization right now. Globalization, as he explains in the book, is frowned upon, is viewed negatively by almost everybody, and uh, left and right. And um, so good for him. He gets it. He gets it. And, and, and that is real power. Uh, so um, if you look at... Uh, now for my uh, more critical uh, part. Again, I, I'm enjoying the book. He reads the book. He's quite a character. He's got a great reading voice. He fills it with emotion. So I actually recommend it. The End of the World is Just the Beginning is actually quite enjoyable and interesting. You'll learn something. You'll get a different perspective, the kind of perspective you'll get from most historians or from me, for that matter. And um, you will... Um, yeah, you, you, and I think his predictions for the future are interesting um, and quite possibly true. Scary, very scary. Although if you're in America, less scary, but potentially uh, true. So what is the issue? And this is the issue that you see in... Uh, Diamond's book, uh, Guns, Germs, and Steel, you see it in Harari, you see it in others. And that is that almost all books that try to come up with a large-scale history of the world, story of the world, ignore the one thing that I think ultimately shapes the world. The one thing that in the long run in a sense, is the determining factor. And that is ideas. For Peter Zeehan, the world is shaped by geography and demographics. And there are, everything else just happens. He, he, at least in this book, he doesn't really explain it. It just happens. The Industrial Revolution just happens. It's an it's a outcome of a sequence of events that just roll together because of location and because of certain actions that happened before. And it's kind of a, this causal sequence of events. But there's no, there are no individuals in the sequence. There's no ideas in the sequence. There's no culture in the sequence. There's no philosophy in the sequence. There's no political theory in the sequence. They're just things happen. And look, they happen, I can explain what they happen through geography and through demographics. And when I read this, yeah, geography matters. And yes, demographics matter. But both are clearly dwarfed, in my view, by the role of ideas, by the role of ideas. Um, so. It's it, it's fascinating to, to to read somebody who 
expounds, he's really he's smart, knows a lot, expounds on history, knows a lot of history, um, is clearly pro-success, pro-prosperity, uh, uh, and, and yet doesn't see how ideas shaped us all. And of course, ideas are not in a vacuum. Ideas are concretely shaped, partially by the people uh, who embrace them, uh, partially by the accidents of geography and the accidents of population uh, that, that, that partially determine, I don't know, why Aristotle is not picked up, but Plato is, why Aristotle is uh, lost to the West and then rediscovered, uh, why, uh, why, you know, is it an accident? For example, uh, Peter Zian talks a lot about uh, Portugal and Spain and the importance and why they are the ones who first go out exploring and why they are the first in the West to kind of go out there and, 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 and establish uh, navies. And, and, uh, and, and it's, partial, it's because they, they live in this peninsula, so they only have to protect one border. Things like that, right? And I'm thinking, no, I mean, that's all true. <laughs> it's true. They have a coast of the Atlantic. They have a coast on the Mediterranean. They're surrounded by water. They also have only one border to protect. All of that is true. And all of that probably played a role. But what's also true and maybe much more fundamental is that the Iberian Peninsula is where the works of the Greeks were preserved by the Muslims. It's where, in the 14th, 15th, 16th centuries, the best libraries in the world existed. It was where Aristotle's works survived. It was where great Arab and Jewish philosophers lived. And it was this fertile soil in which philosophy, primarily Aristotelian philosophy, it was, it was there in the soil, in, in, in the libraries. <laughs> so, that, so that when um, the Christians conquered the peninsula, to their credit, which is very rare for Christians to get credit for me, to their credit, they didn't burn the libraries. They studied them. They took a lot of the books, copied them, and sent them to Rome, where Thomas Aquinas read them. So that's even the, that's the 14th century. So this period of the 14th and 15th century, which are the period where Iberian Peninsula establishes itself. Actually, Aquinas is 13th century. Is that right? right. A periods in which. The Christians are just coming in, they're discovering these libraries, they're discovering these ideas, they're discovering this thought, and it is what makes that culture, the dynamic, exciting culture that it becomes, and it is what makes them curious about the world, and it is what makes it possible for them to sail across the oceans. Now, if those libraries had been in Tbilisi in Georgia, yeah, the world, the history of the world would be very different. The fact that the Arabs went in that direction, established the libraries to the west, established them on a peninsula with a, with a coast to the Atlantic, which was easily defensible. All of that it probably is good. All of that probably made it possible. Who knows how history evolves if they'd gone east and the libraries had gone east. The libraries in Baghdad, by the way, which were even better than the libraries in, um, in uh, Cordoba and uh, in, in the great cities of southern Spain, the libraries in Baghdad were even better, but they were all burnt. Where were they all burnt? Before the Mongols even got there, they were burnt. And then the Mongols came and basically flattened all of Baghdad. So whatever was left, whatever was left was gone. So the Western civilization was reborn, in a sense, in the Iberian Peninsula and in Italy, where these works were read by Aquinas and then influenced the church and which spread through the Italian Peninsula and where focus on 
this worldliness, happiness in this world and worldly interests was introduced by Arist Aristotle, Aquinas, Aristotelian thinking into pre-Renaissance Italy. So really it's, those are, the, those are the places, Italy, Spain and Portugal, where you get these ideas. See, but that, you have to think, you have to see the world of ideas. And, and this is where, and I don't know what Peter Zeehan's views of, of um, uh, free will and individual agency are. My guess is he's probably got pretty good views. But certainly Harari, who's a determinist uh, and who doesn't believe in free will, who, who views us very much as mechanistic beings, uh, and many of the other writers on history who, who kind of don't view free will as that as, as existing or important or, determin or determining of the future, um, they ignore this. And, and again, when I recommended The Cave in the Light, this is why I love that book, because that, that is a book that delves into not so much history, but the role of ideas in history through a particular path and a particular lens. Uh, Plato versus Aristotle, it's a great book. But conventional writers on history don't, many of them don't do that. And it's something to be wary of because it's very seductive to hear their stories and to buy into their stories as, 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 as the cause of, cause of factors in history. Guns, Germs, and Steel is a great example. Well written, interesting. Fascinating sequences. They all make sense, kind of. But as Leonard Peikoff illustrates in The Ominous Parallels, and in a, a, a magnificent talk he gave uh, at Fort Hall Forum years and years ago called The Role of Philosophy and Psychology in History. The role, sorry, The Role of Philosophy and Psychology in History. What shapes history in the end is ideas. When Peter Zeehan talks about the decline in, uh, in population, in uh, the demographic decline, the shrinkage of the size of families, uh, the fact that we're having fewer and fewer kids, all of that is true. And he can, he can show you mathematically and he can show you from every, all these countries in the world how it's happening and the speed at which it's happening and so on. But, and, and you could argue, well, it's just, you get rich and you have fewer kids and you have a lot fewer kids and you have less than replacement. And that's, some of that is absolutely true. Wealth matters a huge amount to demographics, to the number of kids we have. But is that the only factor? Does culture make a difference? Does people optimism or pessimism about the future make a difference? If you change the culture, will you change people's behavior vis-a-vis -vis children? Well, we know that's true because even wealthy religious people have kids, lots of kids. So religion seems to matter. Ideas seem to matter. Israel is a good example. I haven't seen Peter talk about Israel as an example, a county example of the demographics because Israel is a country that I remember not that long ago, a few years ago, really, really, really being worried about the demographics and a lot of people around and it, because Jewish demographics were collapsing and uh, Arab demographics were holding up in terms of them having a lot of children. And then suddenly, over the, just the last few years, that shifted. And Jewish demographics, Jews are having more kids and Arabs are having a lot less kids. Now, Arab having a lot less kids is uh, foreseeable because as they get wealthier and more westernized, particularly Arabs in Israel and, and, and among the Palestinians, they have less kids, which is exactly the pattern Peter documents and, and, and that is consistent with everything we see around the world. But the idea that secular Jews are having more kids is strange. It doesn't make any sense. It goes against what you'd expect. Israel's become richer, more successful. It's also become more optimistic. It's also become more energized. It's also become more positive about the future, more confident in its own future. 
Does that have anything to do with it? I mean, I think so. So culture matters. Freedom matters. One of the interesting things is, again, Peter talks about the rise of America and its advantages, the natural resources, to, uh, both on the Atlantic and the Pacific coast, and uh, you know, a, a desert in its south, a, a difficult border in its north, but a friendly neighbor uh, in the north, all of that. And everything he says about America is absolutely true. But America would have evolved completely differently and had a completely different destiny, completely different future if America had had a different political system. And maybe political system somewhat has something to do with declining birth rates, particularly in places like Russia and China. Russia, by the way, is one of the fastest shrinking populations. All those Putin fans are going to have to live with a Russia that is weaker and weaker and weaker as we move into the future. For all kinds of reasons, among others, population. And a brain drain, 500,000 people leaving since the war began. And the smartest, the best people leaving. So you can't ignore ideas. Political ideas, but more importantly, political ideas ultimately are determined by what? They're ultimately determined by metaphysical and epistemological ideas, moral ideas, philosophical ideas. You cannot ignore philosophy. Now, it would be fascinating to take what Peter knows, Peter Zine knows about geography and demographics and integrate it with a philosophical, cultural, ideological perspective. That would be amazing. And that would be, I think that would be the right approach, the, the primacy of ideas within the context of geography and, and, and demographics within the context of germs and guns and other stuff going on. Something wrong with the audio? Uh, Francis says, describe, uh, describe American success to geography, demographics is, is a bit silly. It is, but it isn't. I mean, America, it was unique. It was unique in that it was a brand new land. It was unique in that it had this ability to expand westward. It was unique in that that expansion westward also happened to include some of the most fertile land in all of human history. It, it, it is unique in the sense that it's the only country other than Canada and Mexico. I mean, it, 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 that has both a... a, 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 a Atlantic presence and a Pacific presence. I mean, there's a lot of things unique about America that, that positions it phenomenally well to be successful. But of course, none of that would have happened. If the audio is weird, it's because of the internet uplink. So there's nothing I can do from here. It's uh, hopefully will get better as the internet strengthens. Audio, uh, audio is back, Evan says. So, um, but imagine, imagine an America that doesn't have a war of independence. Imagine an America that remains a British colony for another 50 years, maybe 100 years. Does it develop as one country? Does the, uh, uh, what do you call it, the Louisiana Purchase ever happen? Does America go to war to Mexico? There is no America. Is there a war with Mexico to take over the Southwest? Is California part of America? Are there five different countries? Are there 10? Are there 20? Does it become a, a, a reflection of Europe? Is much of America taken over by Mexico? Is Texas an independent state, country? Who knows? Without a set of ideas that shape the union, that shape what Americans want to do with America, is America, does America have the geography that is so beneficial? Does it have the demographics that are so helpful? Do millions and millions of people emigrate to America. If it's a 
authoritarian dictatorship? Well, probably not. They emigrate because of the freedom. So the demographics, the, the, the huge growth in the American population, and the move west is driven by the fact that America is free. The Industrial Revolution and, and, and Britain becoming this amazing uh, you know, bastion of trade, yes, something to do with the fact that it's an island, yes, something to do with the fact that it sent boats out and traveled around the world and it, they discovered they could outsource and, and, and the trade was a good thing. But there are lots of islands. And the Industrial Revolution happens in England not because of that primarily, but because something in, the, in, in Britain makes possible the existence of a John Locke and an Isaac Newton. Something in England makes it possible for people to start businesses and to profit from them. And, and the attitude changes and the culture changes because of these thinkers and ideas you cannot take the British and Scottish Enlightenment out of England and pretend that they, everything is the same. It just isn't. These are actually the determining factors. And here again, I, I encourage you to read the Ominous Parallels by Lena Peikoff, where he shows step by step by step in a fascinating, interesting, beautifully written way the way ideas shape culture, the way ideas shape politics, the way ideas shape, ultimately, even technological advance. The Enlightenment follows the Renaissance, which the, and the Industrial Revolution follows the Enlightenment, and that sequence is a sequence of ideas that manifest in action and reality. And America is a product of the Enlightenment. If the Americans had rebelled 100 years earlier, everything would be different. If the Americans would have rebelled 100 years later, everything would be different. Americans rebelled at the exact right time from an ideological, political, philosophical perspective because it was the era where the ideas of liberty, the ideas of freedom, the ideas of rights were at their pinnacle. Pinnacle is not exactly the right word. They were most spread, most around. So when you look at the future, demographics are important. As, as Peter Zane says, and, and we agree on China. But it's funny, he never mentions, with regard to China, the fact that authoritarian regimes like China don't produce technological advancements. Authoritarian regimes like China don't create wealth. For him, it's more China's in decline because of demographics. And they are. They're a shrinking population. And it's very difficult for China to generate the kind of economic growth with a shrinking population and, much, much more importantly, with authoritarian government. Authoritarian government. So if you combine our knowledge, our knowledge of political, of, of philosophical ideas, of political ideas, the, the, the politics of liberty versus the politics of oppression, but more importantly, if you combine them with, as Leonard Peikoff shows, the role of epistemology and how epistemology is so crucial to development of proper moral ideas that are crucial to develop the right political ideas, and you combine that with an understanding of the geopolitics and of resources, as, as Peter does, and of demographics and geography and all that. Yes, that is an incredibly powerful tool in predicting the future. And I'm going to say, I think that if you add the demographics, Peter Zane claims, and, and I haven't run the math I guess I, sh I, I believe him. I'm not sure I believe him, but maybe he claims China's population is going to half in the next couple of decades, I think. China's going to go down to 600 million people. 
if that is true, that is truly unbelievable. But not only that, the population is going to age. They're going to have fewer and fewer and fewer productive people in their productive prime, which is true. But if it's that fast, then China's finished. China's finished. Because if you add to that the fact that innovation is something young people do, working hard is something young people do, entrepreneurship, starting businesses, in other words, wealth creation. If you add to that the authoritarian nature of China and the bad economic policies they're putting together and the ideology of China, which is in metaphysically and epistemologically very mystical, the fact that China doesn't have a role model to look at, i.e. no United States that is free, capitalist, and prospering, then I agree with Peter completely. China is in deep trouble. And I also think that if China is in deep trouble, to a large extent, we need to really think about the extent to which we are, because trade is win-win. We benefit from trade for China. And, you know, if we're also going to shut down trade with China, I mean, we're, we're, we're in deep trouble. Um, so I, I, I like integrating the ideas. I, you know, one of the, for example, I'll give you an example. I was thinking about this. One of the examples that he doesn't really deal with because he looks at a uh, at, at number of children in terms of the demographics. But one of the things he doesn't deal with, which I will deal with in a, in, a, in a separate show more thoroughly, but is the issue of immigration. So for example, the United States is on the verge of having negative population growth. But the United States can solve the problem in a way that I'm not sure China can, although China might do this, we'll see. And that is through immigration. For example, if I was running China right now, I would open Chinese borders. Maybe not on the West to more Muslims, but certainly in the South to Vietnamese, Taiwanese, uh, uh, Cambodians. Those are relatively, I think, young populations. Let them come. And if you start seeing a shrinkage in Chinese population, I mean, you will. It's not an if. It's happening. Then what you will get is people coming in to come and work in China so that the Chinese, China doesn't collapse completely. So one way in which you can replenish your demographics is by importing people. Yeah, one of Freeman says North Korea. There's a good idea. What about opening up your border to North Korea and telling the North Koreans, hey, come to China. We'll give you job. You know, we'll arrange for you to get jobs. I mean, imagine how wonderful that would be. Both it would be good for China and it'd be amazing for the North Koreans. And of course, people want to go where there are jobs. They also want to go where there's freedom. So some people wouldn't want to go to China. Some people would be hesitant to go to China. But it's one way South Korea and Japan can solve their demographic problem. I mean, Japan is collapsing demographically. I think South Korea is collapsing even faster. Well, again, open up your borders. Maybe some Chinese would like to leave China, suddenly Hong Kong. What about the United States? If we're really demographically going to start shrinking, well, we can solve that through immigration. Open up the borders. Bring people in. And you solve the particular problem that Peter is worried about. Now, the problem doesn't go away because the countries from which they're leaving are going to be in trouble. But that's, that's reality. But again, this is determined by ideas. There's a reason why people want to leave Central America and want to come to America. One is free and one is not. The reason why people want to leave Africa and go to Europe, one is free and one is not. One is rich and one is not. But Europe, again, faces horrific demographics, which immigration could solve. And here, by the way, again, one of the, one of the great benefits of the United Kingdom, one of the great benefits of, of England, Britain, 
is that in spite of the fact of being on an island, in spite of the fact that demographically, again, it's a rich island, so people are having fewer and fewer kids, so there's a shrinking population. What keeps England going, what keeps the UK going, is immigration. In spite of Brexit, to the Brits' credit, immigration has not declined. <laughs> What's happened is, is something they did not expect, and that is that the, the ethnic background of the immigrants has shifted. So uh, before Brexit, uh, almost all the immigrants to the UK in the years before Brexit were Eastern European, or many of them were Eastern European. Not all, many of them. Um, Post-Brexit, Eastern European immigration has collapsed, but you get increased immigration from India, Pakistan, and, and they are getting quite a, few, quite a bit of immigrants to the Arab world. But this is revitalizing the UK. And you might say, yeah, but they bring in the third world culture. Well, look at the conservative government. You guys should list... Get a list of the people in the conservative government. Now, the woman at the top is a, you know, white woman, Liz Truss. But almost everybody else in the cabinet is brown, black in terms of skin color, female. If it's male, the brown. And these are really good people. I, I mentioned Kemi Badenoch, who was raised in Nigeria. Born in the UK to Nigerian parents, went back to Nigeria, raised in Nigeria, then came back to, to UK and then um, uh, went to high school, I think, in the UK. And today is a prominent politician. But look how many conservatives, and again, the conservatives in the UK are much better than the conservatives in the US, primarily because they're secular. So demographics are now destiny. Policy, driven by philosophy, is destiny. And unfortunately, we have rotten philosophy driving today and therefore rotten policy. So destiny is consistent with the demographics. We're going to hell. But it's not primarily going to be because of demographics. It's primarily going to be because of the statism and the fascism and the nationalism and the, uh, the, 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 the right and left wing statism that is the consequence of the mysticism of subjectivism and ultimately the moral altruism that is driving this culture and that is driving the political agenda of the culture. So in this case, the outcome is consistent, but the causal factors are different. And this is why I can be more hopeful than Peter can. Because if it's demographics and geography, then it's demographics and geography, and it is what it is, and it will be what it will be, and there's nothing we can do about it. But if it's ideas, if it's philosophy, then we can change our destiny. If it's ideas, if it's philosophy, then we can have an impact. We can, for example, advocate for immigration, which would solve, at least locally, the problem. We can advocate for, for example, Freedom, which will increase immigration and increase the productivity and increase the, the, the optimism and the, 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 the efficaciousness of the people around. And I believe that as they become more efficacious, as they're more optimistic, as they're more positive, as they're freer, they will have more kids. We can convince people to think, to use reason, to live, to live the best life that they can live. Again, I think the more people are convinced of that, the more people embrace life, life with a capital L, the more they embrace living, taking their life seriously. And the more they're convinced, the more they're certain that their mind is efficacious and they can achieve happiness and they can live a good life. the more optimistic they become, the more productive they become, the more they will demand freedom, the more I think they will even have kids. So, if you don't take ideas seriously, then you get 
caught up in determinism, even if you yourself are not a determinist, even if you believe people have free will, historical determinism captures all. Oh, wow, Jacob Rees-Mogg, another real kind of ancient Brit. That's, that's quite a name, Jacob Rees-Mogg, uh, is head of the energy department. Now, Jacob Rees-Mogg, last I know of him, was a real free marketer. He was one of the, one of the, conser the best conservative members vis-a-vis uh, -vis free markets. So, look, there's hope for the UK. I, you know, uh, now, I was hopeful when Johnson was elected and was gravely disappointed, but this looks like a, a, an interesting cabinet. So let's give Liz Truss a, um, let's give a, let's give it a benefit of the doubt. And let's, let's hope that this is a government that will live up to the better members within it. Um, and, and actually, um, and actually do something do something to move the UK towards more freedom. I mean, uh, Jacob Rees Smog is better on climate change, he's better on liberating the energy sector. He's quite good. So you've got a number of good people now in 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 the UK government. All right, um, let's see, where were we? Yeah, I was wrapping up. So you become a determinist even when you don't are not a determinist on individuals, you become a cultural historical determinist because you what can change? Ideas can change. Ideas can change. And if ideas change, then culture changes. And if culture changes, then the future changes. Then the path is not set. All right. Now, I, as I go through Peter Zeehan's Zihan, Zihan, Peter Zihan's book, I'm sure I'll have more to say about it. Again, I'm finding it interesting, so I'm, I'm looking forward to reading through it and uh, sharing uh, parts of it with you. Um, and uh, so um, that should be that'll be fun. And uh, yeah. All right. Um, Harari. I can't, I, Harari I can't stand, because Harari is a determinist at the individual level. And he's not that interesting. See, Zian is interesting, and I'm learning something new from him. I don't really learn anything when I listen to Harari. It's the same old stuff that you hear from so many deterministic academics. All right, uh, let's see. I want to quickly see if we have... Um, um, okay, so uh, I don't see off-topic... Uh, off topic. Colt says, the idea of immigration seems pretty cool. It will solve our demographic problem. I can't wait to propose this to my conservative friends. Hopefully, I don't get run out of town. No, seriously, wish me luck. You need luck. Yeah, I mean, conservatives are all for free speech unless you want to talk about immigration and then they want to shut you down. They're not interested in listening to anything about free speech, uh, about immigration. So let me know what they say. But yeah, it solves the demographic problem. It solves the economic problem of shrinking demographics. It, it, you know, it solves the entrepreneurial problem. Uh, immigrants are entrepreneurs. So many of the CEOs of our top corporations today are immigrants, many of them from India, for example. Uh, you know, it's, 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 it's unbelievable the benefits the United States would get from immigration, from vastly increasing immigration are so huge, they're so large, that I don't really, I don't accept any, I, I, I don't think, I, I, I don't buy any of the counter arguments, even if some of the facts around the counter arguments are true. It's just the benefits way outweigh the costs, way outweigh them. 
I mean, massive increase in immigration is, of legal immigration is what this country needs. And it, it, it would, it's, it's hard to, I mean, in terms of the one thing you could do that does not require a, a, a decades-long ideological struggle that would launch this country economically, and uh, economically at least, immigration is the number one policy change that you could have that without changing anything else would have immediate massive impact. Of course, if you combine it with deregulation and reduction in the welfare state, it's hard to believe how big of an impact it would have on our standard of living and quality of life. All right, thanks, Colt. Okay, so um, uh, let's... Let's talk about Westerns. Um, and what I believe is the, is the, you know, really the, the wow, Troy, thank you. <laughs> really appreciate that. Thank you, Troy from, uh, Troy Beaton from Australia. 500 Australian dollars. That is amazing. That's so cool. Uh, that gets us almost to our target of 650 for the super chat. So really, really appreciate that. Uh, thank you, Troy. So I want to talk about westerns. Now, in my view, westerns are the most American of all movie genres. It, it, it is fundamentally American. It's about America. It's about American pa America's past. Yeah, there are movies that have used uh, the Western theme uh, and, and done it exceptionally well and placed it in other places other than America. You know, The Seven Samurais in, in Japan is probably the best example of that, um, which is basically a Western set in um, samurai in Japan. But they are American. Everything about the Western is American. What a Western's about? What, is, what, is, what makes a Western a Western, other than being set in the West? And why in the West? What, what is unique about the West? Well, what's unique about the West in the 19th century, when the Westerns are, are framed, is that the West is wild. It is wild across at least two dimensions. It is wild from a geographic perspective. It's a desert. It's harsh. It's difficult. Survival requires effort. Survival it cannot be taken for granted. And in Westerns, the idea of the ruggedness of the place often plays a huge factor, the ruggedness of the place. The second aspect of it is that the West, as portrayed in the movies, is at a state of borderline anarchy. It is a place of lawlessness. It is a place where evil is emboldened. So it's a place with bad guys everywhere. And there is no Western without bad guys, real bad guys, outlaws, who are difficult to catch because the law is not quite reached the West. So it's this borderland, borderland of civilization, the borderland of the law, which is civilizing. The borderland of the lawman. The lawman is not quite established there yet. And it's a borderland of roads, towns, railroads. It's just barely there. Barely there. David mentions Hombre. I actually did a review of the movie Hombre with Paul Newman. Uh, a while back. So uh, if you go back to my shows, may, uh, hopefully you can find it, but I did a review of the movie Hombre with uh, Paul Newman. So the essence of 
a Western, is the civilizing power of the civilizing power of the individual willing to stand up to evil in within a background of great difficulty, great harshness, both naturally and from the perspective of the people. The good guys are usually outnumbered. And the, just the circumstances make it challenging and hard. It is essentially a genre about heroes, essentially about genre of heroes using force to civilize, using force to defeat evil, to defeat the bad guys, to defeat those who would turn the West into a complete uncivilized, bloodthirsty, bloodthirsty uh, 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 wilderness. They were on the side of the town folk. They were on the side of the producers. They were on the side of the farmers, the ranchers, the people who want to produce, create wealth, build families, uh, bring civilization to the wild. Yeah, I like that, Jennifer. Team the wild. It's a story about the heroes. The Western is fundamentally about the heroism of individuals. It's about heroes teaming the wild. And taming the wild both teaming this really, really nasty desert geography place and taming the people. So, but it's, it's about civilizing the world, but it's about heroes civilizing the world. It's, it's, it essentially requires a hero. Now, the heyday of the Western, sadly for you guys, has long passed. The great Westerns were all done in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. By the time of the 60s, the Western is in decline. In two ways, the Western declines, starting in the 60s. And, and this is all leading up to my review of True Grit. <laughs> the Western is in decline because starting in the 1960s, what you get is anti-heroes. What you get is people who might be doing good things, but they're not good people. If you think about the 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 the, the a, a classic western. I don't know one of my favorites all time westerns. The book is actually better than the movie. One of my all time favorite westerns is Shane, S A H S, sorry S H A N E Shane, which is just a fantastic. It's about the gunfighter, the individual, the hero, who is encounters a, a family of farmers who are trying to build a life and create something and make something. But they are threatened by the bad guys. And he must go up against the bad guys and defeat them in order to save the family and to allow civilization to continue. Now, it's a beautiful movie. And, many respects, characters, and the conflicts, and, and, and uh, what he has to give up in order to, to achieve his goal of, of helping this family. Uh, it, it's a very powerful, beautiful, wonderful movie. Shane, I encourage you to watch it. I know a lot of people have not seen it. And there are a lot of good Westerns. We can go over some of my favorites if you're interested. Um, but. They have a hero, and the hero is the strong, silent type. Uh, he, he's, he's not a man of a lot of words. He is a man, first of all, and he is oriented towards doing the job and getting on. Right? And that kind of hero disappeared in the 1960s. 
1960s heroes are loud and gross and drunk and yeah, they might do the right thing, but not for the right reason. They fall into it. Spaghetti Westerns make uh, 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 caricatures of true heroism, caricatures of, of Westerns. I know people love the Spaghetti Westerns with Clint Eastwood, but they're, 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 they're undermining of everything the Western is about. He's not civilizing. He's not fighting evil because he's trying to defend good. He's fighting evil because, because there's money in it, because he's a cynic, because he doesn't like them, because whatever. But not because there's anything good he's trying to attain by him. I mean, in many respects, Spaghetti Westerns are kind of a nihilistic attempt to make fun of American Westerns and make fun of the, the, the great heroes and make fun of the idealism, the idealism of the West, of the Western. And the other aspect of this is that there's a, there's a rejection of the hero, a systematic rejection of the hero and what it takes to be a hero, what it means to be a hero. Tom, thank you for your support. And you see that in the 60s, you see that in the 70s, you see that to this day. There's also a, a, a purposeful naturalism in modern Westerns where everybody is dirty and filthy. Now, in the real West, they were all dirty and filthy, absolutely. But that became essential, whereas in the old Westerns, the dirt and stuff was non-essential. So it was cleaned up so you could focus on the action and the heroism instead of on the shit. Sam Packenpa made the Westerns almost a celebration of violence with anti-heroes. Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid made Westerns where the bad guys were the good guys, where you sympathized with the criminals. And they were funny. And this brings us to True Grit. And the original version, at least, 1968, I think it was, maybe 69, with John Wayne. Now, John Wayne, to that point, had done many of the great Westerns. Many of, you know, uh, John Ford, maybe the greatest director of Westerns ever, had had, uh, had John Wayne in Stagecoach, and she wore a yellow ribbon, and the searches. And we can talk about the searches, because the searches is not, a, is, is not exactly a prototypical Western. It's, it's, it's a little out of genre. I think it deals with something completely different. I think the two great Westerns, really great Westerns, The Searchers and um, The Unforgiven, the 1960 version of Unforgiven, both are set in the West, have cowboys and Indians, if you will, but they have completely different themes, have, have themes that have to do with racism and, 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 and very, very deep things, very meaningful themes, and, and they're really both great movies. But John Wayne had always been a hero. Uh, Who Shot Liberty Valance is another John Wayne movie with, with Jimmy Stewart, great movie. Um, I, I'm trying to look. There was Rio Bravo and Rio Grande and Red River. And there's just a bunch of John Wayne, good John Wayne westerns where he plays a hero, a sober hero. Drinking is never an issue. The, 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 the usually, in these uh, movies, the drunkard was, was Dean Martin, who was the sidekick, not the main character. But True Grit, John Wayne plays a drunken marshal hired by a young woman, girl, really, to go catch the murderer of her father. He's constantly drunk. He's a joke of a hero. Falls off his horse. First time John Wayne, as a Western, in a Western, falls off a horse. It's an enjoyable movie. It's a fun movie. But it undermines the whole conception of Westerns. And certainly the 1968 version
Now, I get it that the goal is the hero. We'll get to that in the 2010 version, which I think is better, but the goal is the hero. But the goal is not using force in order to bring about civilization. The goal is not a hero in the physical realm. And in that sense, neither true grit movies are Westerns, not Westerns in the classical sense, not Westerns in that sense. High Noon, yeah, a, a great movie with some problems in it. We, we can talk about High Noon. High Noon is an interesting movie to talk about. I don't know if we have time today to cover High Noon. I mean, there's a, there's a lot. You can talk about Westerns. There's a, there's a lot of... Um, lot you can do. So here's the thing about True Grit. I like the movie. Uh, let's take the 2010 movie. The 2010 with, um, with Hallie uh, Steinfeld and uh, uh, Bridges and, uh, and uh, Matt Damon is a very enjoyable movie. And the character of the girl is fantastic. I mean, she is amazing. Although I find the ending of the movie disappointing, but she's just stunning. I mean, the way she negotiates and the way she's strong-headed and the way she's committed. I mean, who has true grit? She's the one who has true grit. It's directed by the Coen brothers, whose movies generally I like. Um, and it's, it's, it's beautifully shot. It's beautifully made. It's got that Coen brothers quirkiness to it. Um, and she is a fantastic character. She's smart. She's a woman of reason. She stands She stands. She does not bend to anybody. And she forces these male characters to be better, to become better, to strive for better, at least while she's around them. We don't know what happens afterwards. So her character is what the movie's about, and her character is what makes the movie fantastic. The two male characters, I mean, again, it, it, it's fun and it's enjoyable, but they're not heroes. They're these anti-heroes. They're these loser heroes. They're the typical modern hero who's unhappy, who is unsuccessful, who is a drunk. A drunk. So uh, the movie is about her, which is not a typical Western theme. It is not a consistently Western theme. It's a different kind of movie. And I, it's, again, very enjoyable on its own um, because of her. I mean, she's the character that makes this movie. Uh, it's sad to see Texas Ranger portrayed the way Matt Damon portrays him. He's a little bit of an idiot. And he's, he's not very efficacious. Uh, Jeff Bridges' character is efficacious, but he's drunk and he's obnoxious and he's, he's, you know, he's lovable at times. Most of the times you feel sorry for him. He's good at what he does, but there's also some moral grayness there where he, yeah, is he shooting some people that shouldn't be shot. Yeah, the ranger comes through and he has to. Everybody comes through and they have to. But not because they are driving the plot, not because they are driving the story, not because they are making the right choices, not because... It's because of her. It's because of the girl. So, yeah, I mean, I like the movie. I, I don't think it's a great Western, in spite of the fact that I like the movie. Um, it, it's a part of a genre of... Movies set in the West that I think ultimately undermine the great heroism of the great Westerns. It undermines the genre, in a sense. For 2010, certainly it's not a bad movie because there are very few good Westerns uh, uh, in modern times. I'll have to, I'll have to check out the, the Westerns from the 21st century and the end of the 20th century. Um, Fang says, how did you like the scene in the new True Grid when the girl is made to get tra a trade about the horse with the lawyer? That was one of the best. Yeah, I mean, that was brilliant. I loved that scene. 
I loved the scene with her doing the trading. That was part of the best scene, in the, one of the best scenes in the movie. I liked her character. I liked everything about her character, except what I didn't like was the ending of the movie. I would have liked to know more about what this fantastic character had done in life. It seems like she would have been incredibly successful. Like she would have done something amazing in the world. And it's disappointing that she's not. She's kind of bland and there's nothing interesting about her in the end. And you could have just not had the ending. But if you had the ending, that make all that worth it, all, all the effort. You've built up this fascinating, sharp, smart, efficacious, energetic character. And then you just let her in adulthood, she's just there. It's not clear that anything has come of her. I would have liked to know that, I don't know, she built an empire. She, she took whatever her father left her and built a massive ranch and was super successful. And I don't know. It sounds, why didn't she become a lawyer? She certainly had the mind for it. Anyway, uh, I loved the female character. I loved the scene of her negotiating stuff. Um, uh, she was terrific. I just didn't like the male characters, any of them. Uh, Jennifer had a question about Westerns. I don't actually like spaghetti Westerns, although Clint Eastwood looked cool in them. I like this story, the Harry character committed to fighting evil. Yeah, I, 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 I mean, I, I don't... You know, I can enjoy spaghetti westerns. It's not like I hate them. But I also know how great westerns are. <laughs> and, and they're so much better. Here are some of my favorite westerns, right? Just, just so you have them. Nobody asked, but uh, if you're interested. Um, J.J. Jingby says, kind of a modern western. Did you like No, uh, no Country for Old Men? Another Coen Brothers movie. I'm tempted to pay you to review A Serious Man, one of my all-time favorites by them as well. Um, God. I sold Country for No Man. I mean, it was, it was very violent, if I remember right. It's a kind of a Western. I mean, their violence is so over the top. It's so crazy. Um, there's a certain element of... And, and the heroes are so not really heroes on, on, you know, think about the cop in Fargo. She's heroic, but she's kind of so underplayed as a hero. And I, I, I can't remember enough about No Country for Old Man. Happy to review A Serious Man. I'm pretty sure I saw it. Uh, I generally like Coen Brothers movies, but they're all problematic. None of them are, are, are can I say, uh, have great themes or, or any anything like that. Um, so it's, it's uh, what was A Serious Man about? It was about God. Um, yeah, I mean, the Coen brothers have this naturalism mixed in with absurdism. So it's a combination of absurdism and naturalism, which the Coen brothers have that I don't like. Um, so, I, you know, again, I'm mixed, and, and you can't compare it to one of these old Westerns. The, and the violence is... I mean, they do it on purpose. They, 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 they've got a shtick with it. They're being violent to shock, and they succeed. They're very good at it. All right, here's some of my favorites. The Big Country, one of, uh, one of the all-time greats. Uh, Destry Rides Again, a 1930s Western with Jimmy Stewart, fantastic, before the war. High Noon, you know, somebody can ask me about High Noon. I'd love to do a review of High Noon. The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance, a complex, amazing, and, and again, this... Civilizing the frontier, so much of the theme there. Uh, through violence, civilizing the frontier through violence and self-defense. Civilizing the frontier through violence in the hands of a good guy, of a hero. My Darling Clementine, which is almost the same, well, no. Yeah, My Darling Clementine. Um, the Plainsman, which is a, I never see on lists of great westerns, but it is a um, um, Cesar B. DeMille with Gary Cooper, uh, Rancho Notorious, Red River, Rio Grande, The Searchers, Shane, She Wore Yellow Ribbon, 
Tin Star. Nobody ever talks about the Tin Star. I love the Tin Star with Henry Fonda. Um, the Unforgiven. Union Pacific, also Cecil B. DeMille, 1939. Western Union, also Cecil B. DeMille, 1941. Uh, the Westerner and Winchester 73 with Jimmy Stewart. So uh, those are some of my favorite Westerns. Uh, hopefully somebody made a list, if you're interested. Um, and, and you can see the really great ones were made in, in 39, 41, you know, maybe, you know, High Noon is 59, but High Noon is the end of the Great Westerns, and there's a reason. You can see it already in the theme. The theme is already suggesting the end, although Tin Star and I think Rio Bravo were made to combat the theme of High Noon, to combat what was viewed as the very negative elements in High Noon. <clears throat> J. Lord says, there was a revival of real hero in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. It began with Luke Skywalker. <sighs> Not really. I mean, first of all, it would have to be the late 70s. And of course, oh, uh, the Plainsman, the Plainsman? No, the Plainsman would be not 1966, would be far earlier than that. So it would be Cecil B. DeMille, so it would be 30s or 40s. High noon is late 50s, or early 50s, sorry, 52, yes. Um, I don't think there was a real revival, not of these kind of heroes. Luke Skywalker is a shallow hero as compared to these heroes. I'm sorry, I, I'm not a huge fan of Star Wars because I think the, the, the heroism of Star Wars is shallow. The heroes are shallow. Um, the values, are it, they're not personal. They, they don't quite make it. I mean, watch these Westerns. And I don't know what movies in the 80s and 90s you would say have real heroes in them. Um, there was an attempt, but they all always, almost always undermine the hero. So I'm, I'm curious what movies you're referring to. But um, J.J. G.B. says, Serious Man, a very Jewish movie about a physics professor whose life goes bad quickly seeks out help from rabbis, funny and dark. Yes, I vaguely remember this. It's funny and dark um, without a very positive theme, without anything really interesting at the end to say about the world, if, if I remember it right. But it's, it's a, you know, darkness is easy. Having good, good themes. I mean, Westerns had great themes. Again, this civilizing through force in the hands of heroes, that combination and the image of a hero, that's special. And you don't get that a lot. You don't get that in modern movies. I mean, I want to do a show on... Uh, I'm just, we'll do this in a few weeks, months. We'll do a show on, the, on, on uh, Lord of the Rings versus... Um, um, what's the other series? The fantasy series that's on uh, the big HBO series, Game of Thrones. So Lord of the Rings versus Game of Thrones. Not Lord of the Rings and Game of Thrones, but the two series that are going on right now on, on Prime and on HBO. Game of Thrones, Lord of the Rings prequels. I want to do a show comparing those because I think Game of Thrones is very revealing. House of Dragon, I think it's called. It's very revealing of the kind of heroism, the kind of characters, the kind of story, the kind of plot, the kind of themes that people find interesting today. And it's not good. It's not good. Now, I enjoyed Game of Thrones. But I knew, and I, you know, the, 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 the fun, the, just like I enjoyed Breaking Bad, but the underlying theme of Great of Thrones is bad. Now, some of the episodes, some of the seasons even had great themes embedded in them, but the overarching theme is negative. It's negative. My Star Wars review is somewhat overdue, absolutely. Uh, anyway, well, I think it's interesting. And, and on the other hand, the, the uh, J uh, Tolkien's series 
It's also interesting in terms of the themes, right? And how you can draw themes, even in fantasy, how you can get to themes and the kind of heroism and, and the kind of, and the difference in the type of heroism between Game of Thrones and, the, and, and Lord of the Rings is, I think, really, really interesting. But we'll do, we'll do a show about that. That'll be fun for me to do. Um, all right, Corey says, nowadays it seems to be the heyday of medieval settings and fantasy mixed with medieval. Yeah, that's Game of Thrones. And, and yes, there's something very, I don't know, there's something very grounding, I think, in the medieval setting because it's, it's, it's very, you're confronted with nature and you're confronted with physical violence and physical force in an immediate setting. And for given the theme of the Game of Thrones, that is an ideal kind of uh, context. And it seems that people are attracted. It's, it's shocking how many people are attracted to um, the authoritarianism. You know, remember the Middle Ages were all kings and queens and knights and, and the violence of those cultures and how appealing they are when set in a, a, fa a fantasy world, and uh, how freedom, a, a, a proper conception of freedom, is completely, really absent from all of these series. I mean, uh, Game of Thrones tries, plays around with a little bit of freedom, but ultimately comes to the conclusion that freedom is corrupting and that all blows up, right? So, so freedom is not sustainable. Goodness is not sustainable. So it's, it's, it's only evil that is efficacious. And that's part of the appeal of the medieval settings is, is the yuckiness of life in them. Maybe it makes our own life look better, but, but, but it, 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 the fact that it's so dominant right now is interesting. But that's a whole other topic we'll have to get to. All right. Uh, let's see. So we are doing uh, Super Chats. We're like 40 bucks short. And really, the only reason we're only 40 bucks short is because Troy came in with 500 Australian dollars. So you guys are way behind. Way behind. So you want to play this game. You have to chip in. They call it chipping in. Gail, thank you. Really appreciate the support. Uh, chip in. We need at least $40 of chipping in over the next few minutes. Um, and uh, but, but a lot more than that, because actually the 50, 500 Australian dollars is going to be less because of the way YouTube actually does the conversion. So we need like 100 bucks to come in over the next few minutes. There we go. Corey's, Corey's on top of it. Corey's on top of it with Australian dollars. Uh, okay. Corey says, uh, this is, I'm doing this because it's relative to the topic. Corey says, exactly, that is what worries me, how attractive they are to my generation along with the cause for better leaders and leadership rather than taking control of their own life. Absolutely. I think that's absolutely right. Part of the appeal of the medieval times is, is the appeal of, of not a hero who acts for the good, but the appeal of uh, of, of a hero fights for a king, a fights for a queen, and the battle between kings and queens, and 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 you know, Game of Thrones have has has one hero who lands up miser in misery at the end, who lands up really not successful. I mean, there's a kind of an attempt at the end to kind of wrap it all up in a bogus, everybody lives happily ever after kind of way, but it's 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 not right. Um, the 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 ultimate conclusion of it is that it's about leadership and it's about power and it's about strength and it's about orders and following orders. All right, where were we? Um, what was the dark Jewish Western again? It's not a Western. It's, um, it's, it's, it's not a Western at all. It's a uh, movie set in modern times. It's called The Serious Man. It's a Coen Brothers movie. It has nothing to do with Westerns. Not even close. Um, 
All right, here's another one related. Um, is there a very violent movie that you think portrays good values? Or, that, or is that a contradiction? What people liked about um, Game of Thrones was the politics. Yeah, what people liked was the cutthroat politics. What people liked was the array of characters. I think people loved the, the different characters involved. Some of the suspense, some of the pretense of be, being good guys and bad guys. But were they really any good guys? Very few. Um, uh, you know, so um, are there very violent movies that portray good values? Sure. I can't think of any right now because it's it's very hard to think about these things on your feet with names of movies and everything. But sure, I don't think the violence in and of itself precludes it. And you can, and, and there are episodes of Game of Thrones, which I think are excellent, that portray things like the evil of, of mixing religion with political power that are very violent and have good themes and present good values. Um, you know, I, I'd have to think what is a, a good movie with uh, that has a lot of violence and is, um, you know, is, is... You know, part of the challenge is most modern movies have, are, are the ones who are violent. Movies before the 70s were not very violent at least not that you saw it on screen. and uh, But there were also better movies generally, and there were also much more, um, much better ideologically, much better ideologically. All right, uh, let's see, okay. All right, a lot of super chats, uh, a lot of questions to answer, and we're ready at an hour and a half. Okay, let's run through these. Friend Harper, do you know any objectivists in Japan? Yes, I do. Are there any objectivist philosophers, historians who study the East and its philosophy? I don't know. None that I am familiar with. But there are, uh, there's a very active, fairly large group of objectivists in Japan. I, I speak peek to them and, and am in touch with them on a regular basis. Uh, I will be doing some events for them when I'm in Japan next week. Um, and um, they're really good guys. And, and uh, they, they have like one guy who's there is kind of their intellectual leader, I get a sense of, and he's, he's a really smart guy. And he usually serves as my translator or interviewer. Uh, but I get the sense that he knows a lot of about objectivism and and is a really is a really cool guy and yeah so um, yes there uh, they are and I'm sure he knows a lot about objectives uh, about philosophy and history from uh, in the East I just I'm not I don't he's not a, a historian or philosopher but I'm sure he knows a lot about it. All right, Michael, Mike De Dial, um, how much to review a five-page chapter of a book? It's not necessary to read the whole book or context. Now, I assume this is a non-fiction book. I, I do not want to review fiction books. So if it's a non-fiction book, then I don't know, five pages, I don't know, 150 bucks, 30 bucks a page. Uh, but it has to, it can't be fiction. It has to be nonfiction. So if you're interested, let me know. Uh, Fend Harper, can you share what you know about the current scope of higher ground education? Are they in every state? The orientation feels like brightest light hope in the realm of education. Uh, no, I don't think they're in every state. They're in a lot of states. They have a lot of schools. I don't know the numbers and everything like that. But, but they're online. You can find a lot of information about them. Uh, so... I encourage you to do that, but I don't have kind of the breakdown of the details. But it, it, it is positive in the sense of growth. Absolutely. Ryan, 50 Canadian dollars. Thank you, Ryan. Um, I heard a comment today. Chaos is good because it drives innovation. Thank you. Uh, thanks to you and Rand, I was immediately triggered and held my tongue. I knew saying anything in the moment would be counterproductive. What would you say to that remark? I'd say chaos in and of itself is chaos. Chaos in and of itself leads to nothing. 
Now, a situation that can appear chaotic, but is guided by human reason and human rationality, but is not bounded by convention, is not bounded by dogma, is not bounded by authority, is not bounded by something artificial, but chaotic in the sense that you can, you can go anywhere with your thoughts, with your reason, with your you know, reason-guided imagination. In that sense, chaos leads, innovation thrives. But, but what innovation really thrives under is freedom where individuals are using their minds to solve problems, to come up with problems, to discover problems and solve them. So it's not the chaos. It's not the chaos. It's the freedom. And it's the individual mind that, you know, in a, in, within groups, uh, many individuals' minds that trigger innovation, that drives innovation. Chaos, God, there's chaos in Ukraine right now. No innovation in Ukraine right now. There's chaos in Africa right now, in many places in Africa, not innovation. So chaos is, no, chaos does not lead to innovation. Applejack says, great show, but my question is off topic. In Atlas, Rand doesn't refer to politicians as congressmen or senators or president. It's Mr. Thompson will address the nation. In your view, foreshadowing, it's, yeah, I mean, she's, she's um, they don't deserve the respect, <laughs> in a sense. They don't deserve the respect of the title. It's also kind of where you believe you will get to with egalitarianism where the titles matter because they give them power, but they pretend not to matter in the name of egalitarianism. J. Lord says, I will say this for Australia. Powerful protest led to an end of most of COVID restrictions. They nearly all gone now. The Australian people are at least advocating freedom again. Yeah, it took them a long time. And I remember the protests, you know, and they didn't seem to lead to anything. Ultimately, Australia lagged most countries in eliminating COVID restrictions. So I don't think that you can't draw a causal link from the demonstrations to the actual uh, uh, elimination of COVID restrictions. They seem to happen when the rest of the world happened. Um, there were a lot of courageous Australians who went out to demonstrate, not enough of them, and they didn't have anywhere near as much of an impact as I would have expected. So I was disappointed. Fred Harper, the anime One Piece is 1030 episodes long, 1,030. How much to have you review it? Just kidding. The way you describe Westerns, this show fits the description. It's about pirates, very driven by values. That's great. And no, I'm not going to watch 1,030 episodes. Well, of course, unless you pay me, what would that be? 250 an episode? You calculate it. Um, Free Trade says, can't think of a question. So I'll just remind everybody that the energy crisis is an amazing opportunity to promote better political pol and philosophical ideas. I, I like your take on Game of Thrones. Thank you, Free Trade. Michael says, what's the biggest criticism you have about yourself and the progress of Objectives Movement? God, it's too slow? Um, what's the biggest criticism I have? Oh, biggest criticism. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't know. I think we do, we've done... I've done what I needed to do. Um, I don't know that it could have been done better, faster. Um, the progress is too slow, but if, I, if anybody had come up with a better idea on how to do it faster, would have done it. So I'm, I'm not exactly sure where this is getting to. Megan asks, can school choice be legislated in townships? I don't know. Um, I don't know the legal status of a township. You'd have to look into it. Who runs the education budget? Uh, Corey, 
Off topic, you're an early adopter, right? Are you excited for the new iPhone 14 if you're going to get one, that is? I am excited about the iPhone 14. I don't know if I'm going to get one. I usually get every second model, so I'm probably going to wait for the iPhone 15. My, my iPhone 13 is good. I, I, I don't replace it every year. I haven't seen anything about the iPhone 14 was like, I have to get it. I have to get it. I'm curious about the watch. I've got the previous generation. That one, maybe there's some new features that I want to get. And there is the iPhone Pro, the i um, i Watch Pro or something like that. So I will, uh, I will check that out. I'll check that out. But I, I'm not, I'm not sure. Oh wow, Hopper Campbell came in with fifty bucks. Thank you, Hopper. Um, when intellectuals advocate egalitarianism in a welfare state, is this them projecting their own inferiority complex about themselves to the world because they don't think they can make it out there. They want other people to be unable to make it. I mean, there's a sense in which it's not that they don't think they can make it. It's much deeper than that. It's that they fundamentally hate themselves. Again, the best psychologically illustration of this is Tui. Now, I said at some show that I don't think Tui's exist, and people freaked out and gave me a list of all these intellectuals who are like Tui. This is the difference. Tui knew what he was doing. He had a full understanding of his own evil. I don't think people have that. I think they rationalize it away. I think they make it go away. But Tui fundamentally hates himself. He's got an inferiority complex. He knows he can't be successful on the terms of reality. And therefore, he hates reality and he hates himself. And it's his hate of himself that he projects on other people. And that's what egalitarians in the welfare state do. They project their own hatred of themselves onto others. And they enjoy, at some level, the fact that other people are defeated by them. And it's their one little victory that they have. They can't deal with reality, i.e. the material world and, and the laws of physics, and so they deal with people. And they know how to manipulate people, and they know how to destroy people, and they know how to pervert people. And, and that's what they focus on. I hope that answers, Hubbard. Flotatious. Excuse my poverty tier donation. Going to be in school full time for two years soon. Uh, Kath Lab Tech Big equals big dono. Donor? Have you heard people joking about installing U.S. dictator Puerto Rico when the U.S. collapses? I have not. Uh, but, you know, we can talk when the U.S. collapses. I, I hope it's people who have the power to install me as dictator because uh, <laughs> otherwise it's, it's useless talk. I, I want serious people. Liam says, could Bill Clinton win a Democratic nomination today? No. No. I don't think so. Well, no. Let me, I mean, he could have beaten Biden. Yes, I think he could win a Democratic nomination. Could Ronald Reagan win the Republican? And this is the difference between the two parties, is that Ronald Reagan could not win the Republican. But Bill Clinton maybe could win the Democratic. Because the, Dem yeah, the Democrats voted for Biden. Biden's not exactly some kind of progressive nut. He's, he's an empty suit. So is Bill Clinton to a large extent. Francis uh, says, do you have a favorite conductor and orchestra? Yeah, my, I mean, many, but my, my favorite conductor is Toscanini. Um, but I also, I, I like a lot of conductors. I, I, I really like, you know, for some things, Furtwängler, um, although I have a problem with his moral character. Um, I liked um, Carlos Kleiber. Um, I liked Georg Sell. Among the modern conductors, oh, God, what's his name? Yeah, I can't remember. He's an Italian conductor. I forget his name. Um, I'm not a huge fan of Leonard Bernstein. He wasn't one of my favorites. Um, I like Honeck, um, but I like the old conductors uh, the best. Um, I prefer Georg Sell to Leonard Bernstein, for example. Um, I'm trying to think of... Anyway, 
I, I, you know me and names, but I, I, if you, somebody asks me, um, I'll try to get you a list uh, next time of, uh, of some modern conductors that I really like. Mr. Muffin asks, how does your research defer with conservatives when it comes to illegal immigration? Where are they getting their research from? Where are they getting their research versus yours? Um, they're getting it from, um, some of it they make up. Some of it they make up. Uh, what's, her, what's her name who has a book on immigration? Some of the stuff she's just making up. Like the number of immig illegal immigrants in the United States being 30 million. I've run through that math. She makes it up. She's extrapolating stuff that can't be extrapolated, and it's bullshit. Some of it is just bad economics. They just don't understand economics. Um, some of it is from think tanks, conservative think tanks that, and Coulter, yes. Some of it's conservative think tanks that have an agenda. And a, but this is not a research question. There is no, there's no research issue here. What is, what is the fact that the conservative research comes up with that to contradict what I say about immigration? That immigration is a net loss to the US economy? They don't know what they're talking about. Now, where do I get my research from? A, I know economics. It helps a lot. It helps a lot to know economics and to know the fundamental basis of economics. Things like the trader principle, which conservatives don't understand. If they understood it, they wouldn't be, against, they wouldn't be for tariffs. They have no concept of the trader principle. They have no fundamental, real understanding of economics. And the conservatives who do understand economics support immigration, are big fans of immigration. But I get a lot of my, a lot of the uh, uh, numbers I use, um, I, I use a couple of guys, uh, some people, uh, Cato does really good work on immigration. But you can't just trust the work they do. You have to go and read the papers and you have to um, uh, track the figures. I love Brian Kaplan's work on immigration because Brian Kaplan takes a philosophical slash economic slash cultural perspective on immigration, and he does excellent stuff. Again, the issue around immigration is not the numbers. It's not economics. On economics, there's just no argument about immigration. Brian Kaplan is, and on my show on immigration, I'll go through some of Brian Kaplan's um, uh, stuff. And then um, who else? Um, who I had somebody else in mind. And, oh, yes, there's an economist out of um, Texas State University, Ben Powell, uh, who's written on immigration and has a collection of essays on immigration, if I remember right. Uh, and his book on immigration is excellent. And, and he surveys the literature, the economic literature on immigration. And yeah, that all looks good to me. And the stuff I read out of the anti-immigration conservative stuff is just crap. It's just not good economics. And when I read Ann Colton, when I read Victor Davis Hanson, Victor Davis Hanson, who I respect a lot as a military historian, when it comes to immigration, it's, I mean, Victor Davis uh, Hanson argument in the end are all cultural. They're all cultural. His sense that the Mexicans are bringing a bad culture into the country. That's it. And again, that's not economics. We can talk about culture and the causes of it. So uh, those are my sources. Francis asks, didn't Ayn Rand say Kant had to know what he was doing? Yes, I think she said that at some level he had to know. And at some level, they all know. Um, but how conscious it is, I just don't know. Because Rand also, when James Taggart discovers what he's doing, comes face to face with who he really is, he goes crazy. And, and I, think, I, I think most evil people couldn't handle the actual idea that they are evil. All right, J. Lord. Rand had no love for Reagan. No, she did not, primarily over the issue of abortion. 
Uh, also, I fear the woke left will lead the masses into the arms of the theocratic right. Exactly, I've been saying that all along. The woke left will lead this country into the hands of the, the crazy right, the theocratic nationalistic right. That's where we're heading. All right, on that wonderful, pleasant, positive note, I will bid you guys uh, good night. Oh, one more question from Corey. Maybe that level is the knowledge that they're evading something but just don't know what. Well, it's more than that, that they have a glimpse, they have a sense of what it is. Right? Part of the evasion is that they could know what it was if they made an effort, but they choose not to have that effort. Yeah, and Kant is unique because Kant is a genius, not a, a, all these intellectuals are genius. Did Krugman really know what he's doing? He com constantly rationalizes that thought away, evades it through rationalization. Rationalization, coming up with excuses, coming up with pseudo reasons for what you're doing is the way in which they suppress the truth. All right, thanks everybody. Thanks, uh, Troy, for the very generous contribution from Australia. Thanks, Harper Campbell, and many of, uh, of the other super chatters, or all the super chatters, at whatever level you contributed today. I hope you enjoyed the show. If you did, please like it before you leave. Give it a thumbs up before you leave. Uh, share it, um, and uh, encourage people to watch the Iran Brook Show. Uh, that would be great. So help us help us with the algorithms by liking, sharing, commenting, doing stuff with it. All right. Bye, everybody. See you probably Friday. Not sure exactly what time, though.